one of the two best collections of random second sight precognition that I know of is that assembled by Camille Flammarion, French astronomer and one time president of the British Society for Psychical Research. Flammarion collected 1,824 cases of precognition. You can read many of them in a book entitled The Unknown. And like so many books published over a century ago, available for free on Google Books, while Flammarion's name may not be known to you, his most renowned creation, a wood carving, likely is. Weird World. But its weirdness is an invitation to a radical change in perspective. All of Flammarion's second sight accounts are, like the vast majority, spontaneous, along the lines of what I consider the other best collection of spontaneous second sight accounts. Investigative reporter and Newsweek editor Jess Stern's 1963 book, The Door to the Future, published two years before his groundbreaking and best known work, Yoga, Youth and Reincarnation. In defense of spontaneous second sight accounts, Stern wrote, it was in the boundless laboratory of life, not the confining laboratory of the university, not in experimental card tricks, but the spontaneous flow of events that I hope to find the answer to the riddle of the future. For boomers, especially, who spent a lot of time at the grocery checkout counter, rolling their eyes at tabloids like this. There is a very compelling chapter on the tabloid tattler herself before she turned her prowess into a profession. Because of the extensive and all too familiar damage done to the reasoned consideration of second sight by her late career, it is worth dwelling for a few moments on her early unpaid prowess that deeply impressed the luminaries of one of the most skeptical towns in America, Washington, D.C. Both its elected officials, such as Franklin Roosevelt, and its renowned reporters, including Pulitzer Prize investigative journalist Jack Anderson and Martha Roundtree, the creator of Meet the Press. It was Roundtree who got Dixon to appear on a television show with her crystal ball even though most of the second sight images Dixon accessed came through direct contact with people, she did often induce her second sightedness by employing this semi-reflective prop, just as Nostradamus did with his water in a bowl and John Dee with his obsidian mirror on display at the British Museum. The television show called Washington Party House was broadcast on NBC on May 14, 1953 and featured interactions with preeminent Washington leaders. It was surely the first time someone stared into a glass ball and appear, at least in later retrospect, to have transcended time, witnessed by millions of people staring through their own curved glass, the transcendent space. The preeminent Washingtonian for the show that day was former Russian ambassador Joseph Davies, who asked her, how long will Stalin's successor, Malenkov, be prime minister? Her answer, that he would be removed in less than two years, was scoffed at by the ambassador, who mansplayed to her that no Russian chief of state is ever replaced. He either dies like Stalin or is shot. But Dixon held her ground, and indeed, 23 months later, Malenkov was replaced. The ambassador's scoffing turned into a snort when Dixon, once again peering into her ball, ventured, his replacement will be a portly military man with wavy hair, green eyes, and a goatee. Mansplaining again, the ambassador informed her, I've been in Russia for years, and I never saw a Russian who looked like that. Which tells us that he never saw up close what Jean Dixon saw from a distance as indeed, Malenkov's replacement was none other than portly, wavy-haired, green-eyed, goateed Marshal Bulganin. Peering again into her ball, unprompted, Dixon, her voice soaring, declared, I see a silver ball spinning into space, 
coming out of the east, which leads me to believe that Russia will be the first to put a satellite into orbit, thus giving America a four-year advance notice on what would come as a shock when Sputnik was launched in 1957. And then, apparently, Dixon continued her accurate future narrative, however tinged with symbolism, by relaying the most distinctive feature of the subsequent Russian leader, Nikita Khrushchev. And I see the ball changing into a dove, then sinking its claws into the scalp of a completely bald man, but not drawing blood.